Okay, my name is Beth Wright-Smith. I'm one of many of the Education Committee uh, members that are here working today. A lot of us have on turquoise shirts, obviously not me, uh, but, but if they're wearing a turquoise shirt and it has this emblem, they are definitely part of the Education Committee that puts on this seminar. Um, we want to thank a couple of, of organizations. Uh, the coffee has all been donated by New Mexico Pinon Coffee, so we want to thank them. We've been doing that all, all fiesta. And then at the break, uh, even for those of you who have not uh, registered in advance and gotten a lunch, we have cookies and brownies at the break along with more coffee and water. And the, the brownies and the cookies have been donated by Patrick Smith with Aviation Re Insurance Resources. Thank you, Patrick. So we will not be turning, or giving you any certificates to show you that you have attended, you've got your name. We will turn them in to the insurance companies afterwards. Uh, if you do not have a U.S. insurance company, either uh, RPS or, or AIR, insurance, Aviation Insurance Resources, please let one of the staff members know so that we can take your name and your information and, and we can send you a certificate if you need that credit and you don't have one of those two insurance companies. Um, probably by now, everyone knows where the restrooms are since it's the you know, third, fourth day of Fiesta, uh, the only door that you can enter through is the one by the, where you came in to register. The other two will be locked. You can go out through them, but you can't come back in. If you would like to go to the restroom, it's, it's probably a good idea to use the one that's already open so that they can see your faces and they know you're supposed to be coming back in. If for any reason you need to leave for an extended period of time, we have a hand so you can leave and come back in 10, 15 minutes later or whatever. But if all you're doing is going to the restroom and you walk out that door, they'll remember you and make sure that you can get back in. Um, this will have uh, wings and um, wing credit. We're going to be giving everyone's uh, information to the FAA. If so, if you participate in the wings program, you don't have to do anything more. If you don't, you can ignore it. Uh, we also do have evaluation forms. You've got these pink forms in everyone's packets. Please fill those out. We've, we're going to have boxes by each door as you leave this evening. And we really appreciate it when you fill those out because we use that feedback to determine what we're going to do in future seminars. So much of what is in the seminar this time and last time and you know, for the last several years, has been from feedback from the participants. So please do fill those out. Um, it, when, we, when you get, it's a ways down here, it's not the very first one, but when you get to the accidents, incidents section, your handouts are gonna be in reverse. The speakers' names are in the correct order, but the handouts are gonna be flipped around. So it's, it's in there, it's just not gonna be in the correct order. Um, this, this seminar is going to be taped. Art Lloyd Jr. is taping it for us and eventually, <laughs> eventually once he has had a chance to recover from Fiesta like everyone else, it will be on the Quad A website. So you can, if you missed something uh, or you weren't sure of what somebody said, you can go back and check it out again. When you leave, Please, please, please pick up after yourselves, throw your trash away. Otherwise, the committee has to do it. This room has to be back exactly the way it was uh, at the end of the morning after Fiesta was done flying. And we don't want to be here for three hours cleaning up after you. So please pick up your garbage, throw it away when you're done. Okay, our, our first section, as you can see, deals with, uh, with uh, medical issues. And... Probably everyone knows by now that, that medicals are coming in some form. 
the NPRM, the, the uh, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, should be out sometime between next month and probably the beginning of the year. How it's going to be worded, nobody knows for sure. A BFA representative told us that it's probably going to com apply to all commercial pilots, but only if you're using it commercially. I don't know how they would determine that. So that's, that's what they're thinking. It's not a given. Uh, and because there are so many questions, our first speakers are going to be talking about m medicals and, and what if you're already commercial and you don't want to be anymore. So, so we have a, an AME, an a Aero or Aviation Medical Examiner speaking first. And then JD, who most of you probably know, will be talking about can you go back from commercial to private should you choose? The rest of your, rest of the agenda is pretty much self-explanatory. So we will ask our first speaker to come up, please. Nancy, she's got a good name. Hi, uh, my name is Nancy Wright, and I fly a Bonanza, not a balloonist. Uh, and I drove here from my office is in Las Vegas, which is in New Mexico. I see you down there. There is a Las Vegas, New Mexico. Uh, I've lived in New Mexico since 2002, and my first time at the Balloon Fiesta was actually on, on Saturday. And it was really a lovely day, and I didn't really enjoy the fog that much. I used to live in the Bay Area, and I couldn't understand where all this fog was coming. But it was still, I mean, what a special event this is. I just had to say that. And um, even though I'm not a balloonist, I am an aviator. We're all aviators. And I'm hoping to talk a little bit about the flight physical process and maybe make things easier and hopefully less worried about it. So my objectives today uh, is uh, describe what an AME is, what's a flight physical, and most important, do I need to be worried? Um, I have 35 minutes to talk about, that, about this, and I should have plenty of time. Maybe I'll have uh, some time for questions at the end, but this isn't really the right forum to talk about you know, specific medical questions, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. And, uh, when I was researching this topic or looking for balloon photos on the internet, there's just photos of balloons all, all over the place. And I, I've heard that this event is the most photographed event ever anywhere. And I can see why. Um, but a lot of the balloon photos were, were copyrighted. I didn't want to deal with that. So most of the photos that I have for this talk are actually photos that I took myself. And so th these were from, um, Blooms over Angel Fire, which was back in June. I went up with, with Barbara for that. FAA mission statement, we're not happy until you're not happy. I don't know if there's anyone from the FAA here, and of course this is a joke. I mean, you can buy t-shirts with this on it. But the thing to remember about the FAA is that safety is the highest priority for them. And when you study safety, I, I have an interest in safety, especially with medicine and in hospitals. But organizations look at the FAA's safety record as a, a record that they would like to have themselves. And safety is a lot of hard work. It's an active process. It doesn't just happen by itself. And so safety is always going to be a top priority for anything with the FAA, especially with their medical certification division. And so it's not the 
FAA's job is not the Division of Medical Certification's job to make you happy. It's not their job to make the commercial airlines happy. It's not their job to make politicians happy. Their job is to maintain a safe airspace. And it's not those, that those other things aren't important because cause they are, they work hard at that too, but their top priority is always going to be safety. The, the main FAA building is in uh, Washington, D.C., um, along with many of the other federal buildings. But the medical certification is headquartered in Oklahoma City. There was a senator from Oklahoma who really supported aviation, and so they built this in Oklahoma City, which is nice for me because it's a lot easier for me to get to Oklahoma City than uh, Washington, D.C., especially in my bonanza. And the, let's see this button. Uh, the, the building that is on there, there's a campus and there are all these bureaucratic buildings all over the campus and they have these uh, helicopters and, and different aircraft scattered around the campus. When I went to Oklahoma City for my uh, AME training, um, we got to spend some time at, at CAMI, Civil Aviation Medical Institute or, or CAMI here. AMEs talk about CAMI a lot, and we talk about Oklahoma City a lot too, just because that's where it's headquartered. A lot of research happens at CAMI. Uh, they are filled with uh, physicians, and there are medical doctors, also doctors of osteopathic medicine as well, who specialize in aviation medicine. That is a specialty of medicine. And maybe if I was interested in aviation when I was younger, I might have gone way, but then I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be in New Mexico. Now, I am not an uh, aviation medicine specialist. I'm actually a pediatrician, but there are all kinds of specialties who are uh, aviation medical examiners. So they do all kinds of research at CAMI. Uh, they don't make any decision without looking into the research for it. They just don't pull these rules out of thin air. Uh, they really look into it, and they, they take their jobs very seriously. I actually have a, a lot of respect for the physicians and researchers at CAMI. They have uh, they have like this big old swimming pool. So you can practice, you know, water, how to survive water landings, which is kind of cool. And they also have this is a simulator, and this isn't like your you know Windows box simulator. This is if you can see, it's kind of a big room, but but this simulator is like a whole wall, and so there's someone inside there, and it looks like a, you know, like a cockpit of a, a jetliner. And they, all, all kinds of simulators. When I did my AME training, uh, we got to play around with some of the simulators. Uh, there's also a hypobaric chamber there where they do uh, hypoxia research, and we got to spend some time in that too. It's not moving. Is there another computer here? Where is the computer? There? No, we're not on this screen. Is it there? Oh, okay. Well, I'll just I'll just keep going then. Uh, <clears throat> so the next slide uh, shows the different regional flight offices for the FAA. They're all over the country, and there is a flight surgeon uh, at each of these regions. And so here in New Mexico, our flight surgeon is based in in Fort Worth. Oh, there it is. Uh, but the, the main office is in uh, Oklahoma City. All right, now I didn't take these photos, and this is, you know, these are not nice photos. And if anyone was involved, if you know anyone who was involved in this incident, I'm really sorry. We all, all, all us aviators tend to know everybody who's in incidents. But this was a, a crash that happened in Texas in uh, 2016. The, um, there was a pilot and his 15 passengers, and they took off in bad weather and crashed, and it caught on fire, and everybody died. Uh, if, you, if you die as a pilot in your aircraft, the FAA 
investigates everything that happened that could have gone on with that accident. They will look closely at your medical history. And in medicine, we have a culture of confidentiality that we don't like to blab about things with our patients, but this doesn't really apply to the FAA and to the NTSB. Really, every, every little thing about you will be made public, and the NTSB makes public all of their findings also. So that's just one more incentive to please don't die in your aircraft. It's, it's very upsetting for everybody. Um, but uh, so th this, this pilot, to, to make a long story short, he, he, he never would have passed his, his flight physical. He had a lot of medical issues. And one of the findings that the NTSB reported on, you know, one of their specific recommendations was for balloonists to have to undergo flight physicals. And kind of looking at the history of, of uh, balloon crashes, there really ha is, it seems to be a pretty safe activity. I, I looked at an epidemiology study <clears throat> it, it followed, and uh, this is from the National Institute, Institutes of Health, from 2000 to 20, 2011 in the United States for, for commercial ballooning, there were uh, five fatalities. So in, there's a lot more accidents and a lot more people got hurt. But I think that's why there wasn't a big push for, uh, for pilots to have their physicals because it seems like these fatal incidents just didn't happen very often. But even in, 20, in 2012 when this report was, was written, they had noticed that there was an increase in the number of, of incidents. And so they were predicting that there would be even more fatalities. And, and then in 2016, you have you know, 16 die all at once. That, you know, and everyone has a video camera in their pocket. Lots of people took photos of this, and it's unfortunately all over the internet. So what's an aeromedical examiner? We use the term AME. We also use the term aviation medical examiner. I kind of like aeromedical examiner myself. Uh, we are physicians. You have to go to medical school to do this. So either a doc doctor of osteopathy or a medical doctor like myself. We go through a training. The um, initial training is a full week in Oklahoma City where we learn all about aviation medicine, aviation physiology. <clears throat> I thought it was great. Aviation physiology I just find really, really fascinating. But we also learned about the FAA. We went up in the a hypobaric chamber to learn what, what hypoxia does and how it affects your, your decision making. And AMEs are not FAA employees, we are called designees. So we are FAA designees who are um, allowed to, to uh, conduct medical exams. And then we have to keep up a currency, like everything with aviation, we have to keep up a currency, recurring training and all that. Also, with the FAA, as opposed to like uh, DOT physicals for commercial drivers, every exam that I do, every FAA exam I do, is reviewed by the Medical Certification Division. So please don't ask your AME to lie or to you know, minimize things because it could get me in trouble and then I could lose my designation status. Um, another thing is that uh, I, I've been told one of my... Um, Someone who I know is one of the top AMEs in Oklahoma City, and he, he assures me that every aviation medical that is reviewed is looked at very closely. In some cases, like say you have a cardiovascular condition, your, your case is presented to the cardiovascular board where you have a cardiologists who have extra training in aviation medicine who can review this. So they're very thorough, and sometimes this takes a long time, sometimes it takes months. And this is part of the frustrating part of having an aviation medical, is that if things get complicated, it can take a while. But again, it's not their job to be fast and convenient. Their job is to make sure that everything is safe, not just for the airspace, but also for you as an individual pilot. Physical. There are different levels of, of flight physicals, kind of depending on what kind of aviation you do. Uh, the lowest class is the third class, that's for private pilots. And you, you think of uh, the consequences of if, if I'm a private pilot, if, if I'm flying with my husband, 
in the eastern part of New Mexico, and I have a medical issue that makes me have to land my airplane. Um, <clears throat> you know, my, my, my aircraft can be damaged, my husband and I can be hurt, but it's not likely that <clears throat> there will be much damage besides that. So uh, third-class physicals, if you're young, it's every five years. If you're um, over 40, over 40, it's, it's every two years. Uh, then the next level up is a second class, and that's for commercial pilots. Uh, commercial pilots, they, they tend to fly higher performance aircraft. They, they may have more passengers. They're flying at, at the flight level, so you might have more issues with hypoxia. Also, uh, they're flying at night. So there's a, a little bit more to the second class exam. And the second class exam is, is every, every one year. The first class exam, those are really for the ATPs. If, if you think of a, a commercial airliner pilot, if he or she has a, a medical incident like on final into New York and crashes his plane and crashes in the buildings and stuff, that's a, a high consequence. So the, if you're over 40 and you have a first class physical, you have to have it done every six months. And the first class exams have EKGs done every six months as well. Uh, they're, they're really serious about that. The main difference, and I'm a pediatrician, crying babies don't bother me at all. Not at all. It's music to my ears. Uh, the main difference between second class and third class is, uh, first, that it's more frequent. So a second class exam is every year. Um, and also the eyesight. Uh, to have a second or first class exam, you have to have um, a corrected vision to 2020. And, and that, sometimes that's an obstacle, but you, you go to your eye doctor and make sure that your glasses correct you to that much. That's the main difference, is, is more um, eyesight. We also check with, between second and third class, we, we check the near vision, intermediate vision, so you can check your instruments and your charts and then distant vision as well. For commercial balloonists, they're talking about second class. So second class is really what you're focusing on. There, there's another one called basic med, and I'm not going to get into that too much. That's more for uh, private pilots, and that's a way of, of bypassing the AME. Now we get down to what we really need to talk about, which is what does this have to do with me as a pilot? That's what it's all about. Medical I like to think in terms of organ systems, and so that's how I've organized the different... I'm not going to get into this too much, but the medical issues that are likely to affect your performance as a pilot, you have your heart, you have your brain, you have your psyche. Psychiatry is an organ system, even though you can't really hold it in your hands. Um, so for cardiovascular, we worry about sudden cardiac death, which, which does happen, fortunately not very often, but, you know, standing straight up and boom, you, you, you die. And this has happened in the cockpit. It, it, it does occasionally happen. Sometimes it's from heart attacks and other things, and not all heart attacks do that. Uh, so they check the heart very carefully. There's also a valve disease they worry about. Hypertension is part of the cardiovascular system. You have to keep your blood pressure under control. Um, for neurologic, the brain, uh, we worry about having a stroke and having seizures is really the main thing. If you have a seizure disorder, uh, there is just not a lot of leeway with that. Psychiatry is a higher category than you would think. Oklahoma City really focuses on psychiatry in a lot of different ways. Um, they worry about behavior. They will check your driving record. See. Uh, how many times you've been pulled over in traffic stops. Uh, they will ask about uh, any DWIs that you might have had. Up in northeastern New Mexico, we, we have a lot of ranches. We have these rancher kids, and they like to fly their airplanes a lot. Um, they tend to have problems with DWIs. I've, I've been through this with more than one of those kids up there. But FA is really serious, and if you've been stopped, for a DWI, you have to report that to the medical certification division. Even if you weren't drinking, if you were stopped for it, you have to report it, and, and they'll look into it. Uh, other, behavior, other psychiatric issues, depression is, is an issue. If you recall, there was, I can't remember what year it was, there was a German pilot who committed suicide with 200 passengers in his airplane in the mountains in 
Europe somewhere. Uh, this guy tried to pass his medical in the U.S. and, and um, FAA wouldn't allow it because he had too much of a psychiatric history. But he passed it in Germany and that's why, that's why we have these strict rules. It, it's not that you can't fly if you have depression. You just have to m uh, meet the right criteria for it. Also, something like bipolar disorder, anything that tends to make you impulsive. If you have anger and impulsivity issues, you probably shouldn't be flying a jet around. Um, although with balloonists, I, you know, the balloonists I've met haven't had a lot of behavior issues that I've run into. Uh, uh, but, but psych is, is a big deal. Um, in addition, substance abuse, we talked about alcohol a little bit. Alcohol and flying really don't mix. You wait till after the flight's done. And you do the champagne. I, that's, I appreciate that. Uh, marijuana. Look, New Mexico is one of those states where there is medical marijuana, and we're moving in the direction of recreational marijuana here in this state. But the feds say no. FAA says it's a no-go. Having a drug screen is not a routine part of the medical exam. So it's not something that I will check you for. If you have an employer, um, they may have a drug screen for that. And if you have any kind of, of accident in your aircraft, that's one of the things that will be checked for. And it will be reported, and it will be posted online to see. I want to talk a little bit about medications also, kind of along the same line. Uh, it, it, I, I'll, the second to the last slide is really the most important slide as far as useful links and things to look this stuff up at. It's real easy to look this up. The FAA has a list of medications that are a do not fly medications. But everyone is individual. They look at every airman individually and decide, you know, they may allow it for this airman but not for that airman. The AOPA, if you're a member of the AOPA, they have a, a, a medication database. And I think they get their database from trial and error. Um, a, a lot of uh, pilots unions have social, social media sites. They say, well, I was on this medication with, with this medical issue and I was allowed to fly. But again, what works for one airman may not work for another. And it kind of discourages people trying to uh, game the system to see what medication can take and what medication can take. The, the physicians at CAMI in Oklahoma City, they make it real Medical issue be controlled. The most important thing is that your medical issue be stable, not that you pick and choose what medication to make the FAA happy. The last two organ systems, one is ophthalmologic, which actually is part of the neurologic system, but um, cataracts, cataract surgery, glaucoma, that sort of thing. Also, make sure that it's corrected to 2020 for distant, not necessarily for close in, but distant vision. Yes, you're allowed to wear glasses. Um, endocrine, and I just bring up endocrine because it's so common. A lot of people have thyroid conditions. A lot of people have diabetes, pre-diabetes. The FAA really doesn't like the use of insulin. They're getting a little bit easier as far as uh, oral medications that are used for diabetes. Again, as long as it's controlled, that's, that's the most important thing. You don't have to memorize all this, but when an airman comes to see me for a flight physical, if they're perfectly healthy and there's just really no issues and there's nothing on there that I'm going to be written up for, for missing, then I can print out the medical certificate in my office. So that means I can issue you your medical certificate. There are some, uh, this is kind of a new thing, they call it khaki conditions that aliens can issue. So if you have something like, say, let's see, what did I have? It's, it's so small, I don't even remember what it was. Okay, so this is for asthma. You, you can go on to the FAA.gov website, and there's a list of conditions, and they have, there's a worksheet. So you just pull it up. You can do this at home yourself. And now keep in mind, these things are written, these guidelines are written for, you know, for doctors, by doctors, so if you don't really understand a lot of this, print
print it up, look it over. If you're not sure if you meet the criteria, take this to your treating physician. And, and so if you have asthma, say, well, I don't know if this is a khaki condition or not. If, if you don't meet the khaki criteria, it just means that the exam will be submitted to the medical division in Fort Worth or Oklahoma City or wherever your flight surgeon is. And then they will have to issue you your, your uh, medical certificate. Take a while. It, it it would you know, two, three more months sometimes. So it, it's a lot easier if you can do it in your doctor's office. And so this is one of the tricks: is if you have a medical condition, you're not sure. Look at whatever medication databases you can. Uh, look at the khaki protocols. Print them out. Uh, what I've found with this, in contrast to pediatrics, as people get older, they tend to have more medical conditions. So you, uh, print this all out. Be comfortable talking to your treating physician about it. I'm, I know I am, but when you set up the appointment, say, you know, look, I've, I want I want to look at my asthma medication management, and I'm going to need a little extra time to talk with the doctor about my medications because I want to make sure this is cleared for my flight physical. Most physicians are not familiar with, with what is needed by the FAA. It's, just, it's not common knowledge. You know, a lot of doctors will say, oh, you're fine to fly, but they're not the FAA. You have to come into the FAA. And, you know, it has to be given a little bit of time. Oh, I have to you time. Also, it's good if you do this beforehand. If you come just fresh into my office and I say, well, you have, you have asthma and what medicines, and y y some people don't remember the names of their medications. Um, get this all, I have one to two weeks. If you're a student pilot, I have seven days. If, if you're everyone else, I have 14 days to turn this to Oklahoma City. And if I don't do it within those two weeks, then it will have to be submitted to the FAA, and then the FAA will have to make their decision. I try to avoid that if you can. Get all this taken care of beforehand. Also, if you've had hospitalization, just ask for the records. Hospitals are getting better about this. I know the hospital in, in Santa Fe, they have it all online. You, you can look up your own medical record, print it up, put it in an envelope, send it to Oklahoma City. It just be, be comfortable doing that blood test. If you're stopped for a DWI, we have the police report. You just got to be comfortable doing that. And, and getting also your uh, blood alcohol, you know, blood alcohol or breathalyzer test, they, the FAA will want to know that. This is really the, the last slide um, to look things up. Google works amazingly well for this. Uh, usually, if you Google a question, it, it sends you right to the FAA.gov website. The, there is a guide, the AME guide, aeromedical um, guide. Uh, they, it's, it's posted online. They don't want you to print it up because it changes. As the research changes, what, what's written in the AME guide changes as well. Uh, but everyone can open, you don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to be an AME to be able to look at the AME guide. Uh, MedExpress, may, this is a form that you have to fill out prior to seeing your AME. You have to do this. I cannot even start on your med medical exam until you do the MedExpress paperwork. It takes a long time. You have to list all your hospitalizations and every doctor you've seen in the last three years and any driving incidents you might have had, it, it takes a, a, at least an hour to fill all this out. So please do that before you come to see the AME. Um, AOPA has some useful links also. Uh, I think a lot of the pilots in the AOPA, tr they try to kind of game the system, like, well, maybe you can switch your, your medications to this so the FAA won't be so worried about it. Um, and also to find an AME, uh, you just Google find an AME and, and it, it, there's a, a link, it's on the FAA website and it lists AMEs by, by state and also by city. And that's the last slide. So that's all I was going to say and I think we have a few minutes. Or we could just end early. There's one question. There is one question. I'll go ahead. 
for the second class medical, when they do a urine test, what do they test for? Because you said you implied earlier the that they, test? yeah, the urine test. The urine test is two things, glucose and protein. So if you have diabetes, you will have, I mean, that's the definition of diabetes is sugar in the urine. Um, the protein, if you have any kind of kidney disease, you will spill protein in, in your kidneys. Um, having protein in your urine isn't necessarily uh, disqualifying. In fact, it's a normal finding most of the time. But if you have a large amount of, your, of, of uh, protein in your urine, then that means you'll have to go to your treating physician and, and get it worked up. And again, you have two weeks to do that. Another question? Sometimes you may be issued a medication for a temporary situation that's on the list. And then you may have to take it for 10 days, I'm using as an example. How much after coming off of a medication that is on the list, are you okay again? In other words, like 30 days later, or it depends on the medicine, or? And the second question, uh, the second part of that, when, because I don't remember, I never pay attention, but is the date of the physical the date that's on the certificate? What happens when it has to go and get reviewed? Does, does when it finally is resolved and okay, is that the date? Or do they go back to the date you were at the uh, medical examiner? Because then you're shorter than two years or one year. Or six months. It's the date of the exam, is because uh, that's when the evaluation is. I mean, once you get it off your desk, you can come back to your AME and then get that date put on. Uh, the other question was about uh, medications. Uh, like, let's say you, you go to Africa and you get placed on an anti-malarial medication that's on the do not fly list. You're, it means that you're grounded while that medication is in your system. That may not be the exact answer. I hope no, uh, no one from Oklahoma City is, is watching this. But uh, generally, they, they wait for, I think it's five half-lives is what they're looking at. So it depends on how long the medication is in your body for. So uh, let's say the half-life of a medication is, is uh, one day, then you have to wait for five days, uh, something along those lines. But your, the expectation is you do not fly while that medication's in, in your system. And if, if you report that on your Med Express, then the AME will have the opportunity to, to mark that somewhere else, to, to mark that in, in their report that's submitted to the FAA medical certification. Is a second class medical required for a commercial balloon pilot giving a BFR if they don't charge for it? I don't know the answer for that. Uh, it, I think the FAA has really strict rules about what commercial means. And uh, so I, I, I'm not sure. And from what, what I understand, a lot of this is still being worked out. But I, I think they're looking at second class for commercial. Do we have any other? Okay. Uh, regarding the classifications of medicals, what's the threshold between second and first class? Um, when does a commercial pilot that would have a second class medical be required to have an ATP first class? You mean between first and second? Yes, yeah, the difference between first and second. Um, well, I'm not really sure. I, I know that ATPs, if you fly where you, you require an ATP, then you need a first class. What, what's the threshold? What do they, at what point do they need an ATP as opposed to a commercial? You know, I'm not, I don't know what the answer for that okay. is. For, yeah, I think that has more to do with the ATP rating. Uh, also, um, I, in order for an AME to do first class exams, that you have to be a, a senior AME, so you have to, do a certain number for a certain amount of years and have, you know, good grades 
for, for it. So I, I don't do enough uh, aviation physicals, so I don't, I'm not a senior AME. Maybe if I do them for another 20 years, they'll make me a senior AME. Uh, but that's how, how, high th how seriously they take first class exams. All right, I think that's it. Take care. Thank you, Nancy. That was, that was helpful to get an idea what, what we might have to do. Uh, and like she said, they are looking at second class medicals most likely for commercial pilots. So maybe you don't want to have to fill out that big long form and go see, go see an AME every year. So J.D. Huss is going to talk about what we need to do if, uh, if that is not an option for us. Thanks, Beth. Okay, I'm going to start by answering two questions. I'll put my retire, take my retired FAA cap off and put my old FAA cap back on. The first one is, do you need a second class medical to do flight instruction? And the answer is, right at the moment, that is going to be extremely dependent on how this portion of the regulation that is coming under consideration is going to be written. Please write down, if you would, because this is not in my notes, FAR Part 61.23. That tells you what you do and do not need a second class medical for. It does not tell you the requirements of what a second class medical is as far as physical requirements but it tells you the regulations that require you to have a second class medical during those operations. One of the things that it says about instruction at the current time is the simple fact that you do not need to have a medical at all as a balloon instructor. Now I realize that above that there's a, there's a sentence that says when exercising the privileges of a commercial pilot certificate. One of the privileges of a commercial pilot certificate is flight instruction. I have no idea how this is going to be written. We're going to have to wait and see what it says. I don't, I don't know what to tell you beyond that. For your question about first class medicals, first class medicals are defined pretty much in part 61, I forget the paragraph, as to the type of operation you're conducting. I can flat tell you air carrier operations under FAR Part 121, which is United Airlines, Mesa Airlines, airlines like that. You will have a first class medical. It is good for six calendar months and you will take a EKG every six months. So you don't want that if you don't have to have it to make a living, okay? All right, so this gets Written. We, you don't like the way it's written, you're worried that it's going to affect your flying and you want to downgrade, you think you want to downgrade to a private pilot certificate. Okay, so here's how we're going to do it. Well, maybe. Okay, my first words to you are don't downgrade yet. Wait until this comes out. Let's not make a rush to judgment. We haven't seen, we haven't even seen the NPRM yet. So let's not make a rush to judgment about what we're going to be doing. If you look up here on the board, uh, this is the 115th Congress of 2017 and 18, and this thing came in in. Uh, authored in CSR, it was introduced to the Senate on 6-21-2017. Unless I can't count, it's uh, somewhere in the early part of October 2019, and they don't even have the NPRM out yet. So I can tell you there is not a thundering rush in the nation's capital to make this happen. So let's wait till they do it. Now, well, how are they going to go about doing it? Well, let's talk about that. Here's what the regulatory process goes through. Number one, is there a need? Obviously there is because it's congressionally mandated. 
rule of consul, the rule of consul forms, and they had not formed when I talked to Jim Malika, who many of you remember as a member of the Albuquerque FISDO before he went to the national headquarters teams. The rule of consul is in the process of forming now, but has not completely formed yet. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, the rule consul forms, they give the thing a title, they give the basic outlay of it. The next thing that they've done is they start the regulatory management team. And these are the subject matter experts, which is what an SME is. They are the various offices, in this case, the people who write part 61, the people who write part 67. Uh, legal is always involved in this. As Caesar said long, long ago, we have too many lawyers, and I believe him. They write the NPRM and publish it, and it is out for a 60, it goes out between 30 and 90 days. The average time is 60. So I would expect this to be a 60-day period. They will read and catalog your responses to the NPRM, and here is a warning letter, or a warning I'm going to give you at this time, no form letters. If Quad A puts out a form letter and 300 of you write it, one form letter will be saved and 299 will be thrown out because it's the same thing over and over. Get up there and just simply state this regulation is, you know, don't say this regulation's a piece of crap. You know, they'll read it, but it really doesn't do any good. If you have problems with the regulation, tell them what your problems are. This is, I don't think we need to have this. I don't think we need to have a second class medical for flight instruction. That's fine. I'm in hopes that this is aimed at the people who, what I say, you're, as, as balloon ride operators, you're exempt from part 135. It's under a paragraph, it's under FAR part 119, but you're exempt from having to be an air taxi or commercial operator. I think what the gist of this is, I think, is they're trying to move you into the commercial operator realm and as such, as a commercial operator that holds out to the unsuspecting public to take them for a balloon ride, they think you need to have a second-class medical. Now, I'm going to tell you something about a second-class medical because I've had a lot of them and a lot of first-class medicals. The only day that that medical is actually correct is the day that you passed it and the AME signed on the dotted line. Every morning that you get up for the next 364 or 365, if it's a leap year until that thing expires, you're self-certifying just like you are now. I feel fine. My back doesn't hurt too much. My eyes aren't too blurry. They can be bloodshot, but not blurry. I'm under 0 .04 alcohol. I'm not hungover. I can go flying. We are, Airline captains do the same thing every morning for six months. Private pilots do the same thing every morning for two years. I've slipped back into basic med from special issuance for a second class, and I'm doing the same thing every, for four years. Not a bad deal. Okay, no form letters. Once this is done at the end of the NPRM period, the RMT reviews and writes a response to every person who wrote a letter. Stop and think about that for a minute. This is not something that's going to happen in a week. Okay? Then the RMT coordinates with internal FAA and external, that would be BFA, AOPA, the alphabet organizations, that are involved in this groups. After that coordination is done, the RMT publishes the regulation with an implementation period. I don't expect to see this in the year 2019, 
and I, and I think we're going, it, I'll be, I would actually be surprised if we see it by Balloon Fiesta 2020. If we do, I would be surprised. But anyhow, let's go on. Okay, you, the regulation comes out, you take a look at it, and you decide, I don't want to do this, I'm going to be a private pilot. Now, I hold an airline transport pilot certificate in airplanes and helicopters. Right at the moment, I operate under basic med. I cannot operate under the privileges of an airline transport pilot, but I just simply operate under the private privileges of my certificate, which is I can fly airplanes, helicopters, all uh, air gliders and balloons. I just cannot collect any money for it unless I'm flight instructing because you do not need a, in aircraft, you do not need a medical to for flight instruction as long as the person in the right, in the left seat is qualified to be the pilot in command. So in other words, they're not, they're at least got a private pilot certificate and you're teaching instruments or something like that. But anyhow, here's, here's what you gotta do. The first thing you have to do is make an appointment with the FISDO. Now I've got this a little out of order, but we'll get there in a minute. Make an appointment with the FISDO. You cannot do this with the DME. You cannot do this with the CFI. This has to be done by an FAA aviation safety inspector, okay? Complete the form 8710-1. We'll get there in a minute. And you must state the reason for your request. And with that in your handouts, you should have the letter of voluntary downgrade, and you should also have an example of the 8710-1. Okay, here's the letter of voluntary downgrade. Now, for those of you that are in the back of the room and can't read this even with binoculars, it would be I, write in your full name, holder of your grade and rating, commercial pilot, lighter than air balloon, the limitation if you have one, certificate number, whatever it is, freely and voluntarily surrender my specified Federal Aviation Administration FAA certificate to the FAA on the date of your appointment at the FISDO to surrender it. I understand that I <coughs> must take all knowledge and practical tests to requalify for the commercial pilot lighter than air balloon certificate. This request is made for my own reasons. You don't have to state anything beyond that. It's made for my own reasons. That's enough. With full knowledge that unless my with full knowledge that my commercial lighter than air balloon certificate may not be reissued to me unless I again pass the test prescribed for its issuance. You sign it and date it, the FAA inspector issuing you your new private pilot temporary also has to sign it and date it. That's why you're appearing in front of the inspector. Okay? Questions about that? All right. This one's going to be a little tough to see from the back of the room. You fill out an 8710-1 and you'll see that I've got a couple things circled here. I don't know how well this pointer is going to show up. First of all, over here, you're going to state, you're going to request reissuance, and you're going to specify, for the reason for the reissuance, you're going to specify downgrade. You, gotta, you must X the box for reissuance, and you must say, I'm doing this because it's a downgrade. Then you come over here and you're going to downgrade to private pilot in a balloon. That's all you have. And then, of course, fill out the rest of the form. This is not that difficult. You've done the form before. It comes complete with instructions. All of you have sworn you read, speak, and understand English, so this shouldn't be that hard. But the special attention needs to be placed in those Walk into your FISDO, sit down with the inspector, hand him the pieces of paper. He, type, he or she types up, actually they don't. More than likely the clericals will type, prepare a temporary private pilot with the necessary stuff on it. And you walk out with that.
Well, that didn't work the way I wanted it to. That, that's supposed to type, and it didn't, but you've all seen that before because that's how I end my presentations. And with that, I have five minutes to answer questions, I'm told. Anybody want to? Over here. If you went through that process and you got your temporary private, how long is that good for before you take your uh, tests to make it permanent? No, well, there's no test for this. You simply have this reissued. It's good, uh, like any temporary airman certificate, it's good for 120 days. You should have your permanent plastic certificate by that time. If you don't, call, re if you don't, call the name, either write down or remember the name of the inspector you worked with and call him up and say, hey, I'm at 100 days and I haven't seen my certificate yet. Uh, what are we doing here? And have him call FAA Airman Certification Branch and find out what they're doing. No, no, you're not required to do a practical to downgrade. But if you suddenly decide that I really don't want to be a private pilot and I want to be a commercial pilot again, then the thing that you do is you take the written for commercial, you take the practical test for commercial, and you can do that. You can do that at any time. But of course, my comment here is, is if you're not actually flying for anybody, uh, you're just doing this, I wouldn't downgrade. I'd hang on to that thing. Now, I will say this. If your insurance company says, we don't care whether you're flying for anybody or not, uh, you've got a commercial and you're going to get a second class medical, that's maybe, if, or you're not going to be insured, that's maybe when you want to consider downgrading, but not until. Does that make any sense? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, you said uh, you're on basic med now. Yes. What happens if you go from commercial or ATP to basic med? Uh, <clears throat> you can do that, but you have the privileges. Uh, do you have a medical at this time? I went, I went from second to basic med. Second, second class medical? Okay. You could go to, ba if your me medical is valid, you can go to basic med at this time. Basic med really isn't for balloon or glider pilots, it's for fixed wing and helicopter pilots. And basically I'll use fixed wing as an example because I'm, helicopters are too damned expensive unless somebody else is paying for it. Uh, but basic med, you can fly an airplane up to 6,000 pounds, you can fly it day, night, VFR, IFR, you can fly it up to 17,999 feet. You just can't go to 18,000 or above. And you can kill five of your friends at the same time if you're not staying proficient. 6,000 pound airplane, five people in it, that's, that's, pressure, that's a Beechcraft pressurized Baron. I flew them forever, and they're the great airplane. So yeah, you do pretty well on basic med. Yeah. You would, you would have to go through whatever rigmarole you're going through now for a commercial. I took a, for my commercial, I took a nuclear stress test every other year and a regular stress test every year. And they are not cheap. Anyone else? I thank you one and all. And again, safety is an attitude. Please make safe behavior your choice. Okay, before we take our break, I've got a couple of announcements. Um, we do have a few extra lunches, so anyone who, who just registered as they came in today and would like uh, a sandwich and some chips, there's a few of those left. We will also have the brownies and cookies available to everyone, whether you registered in advance or not. The insurance companies 
have have uh, set up in the back, so you've got people there to answer questions for you. If you have if you have um, questions for RPS, they're in the back. If you have question for questions for aviation insurance resources, they're right here. And then we we don't have anybody here for for X insurance, but we do have a a banner with a little bit of information because they are. Um, one of the insurance companies that is available to us. In addition, way in back, we have Jim Livingston, and he's working on a project for people's portraits, and you're going to have three questions that you answer about your past, present, and future. Um, it's just a, a black and white photo, which you'll take back there, and you answer three questions. And it's gonna, you're going to write it on a form in your own handwriting. You're going to write, I am, and you answer that. I regret, and you answer that. Before I die, and you finish that. And he'll provide both the paper to write your, your answers on as well as a release for the photographs. And he'll be in the back. Yeah, just if you want to. This is not a requirement. It's a, it's a special project. Several balloonists have done that when he was uh, on the other side of town earlier in the week. Um, so that's an option. Okay, we will be back here for our next section at 2.15, please. <laughs>